Secured transaction, sometimes called creditors' rights, security interests. We talked about specific ways for a security interest to be created. I gave you this slide to fill out, and it is everything you need to know about security interests, secured transactions. And you say it's blank. Well, that's right. You're supposed to fill it in. So what are the three requirements for a security interest to attach? All three of these, by the way, must be present. So these are three requirements. All three have to be there. Okay, and so number one is the creditor either has possession, right, or a written agreement. It has to be solid evidence that this exists, either by written agreement or by creditor in possession. Number two, the creditor has to give something of value. That's the loan that he gives. Number three, the debtor, the debtor has to have rights in the collateral. You can't use somebody else's stuff as collateral. Wouldn't that be convenient? You know, you say, here's the keys to my roommate's car. You know, it uh, secures my payments. And at that point, would you be very motivated to make your payments because, because the consequences are your roommate loses his car? Eh, I didn't like that car anyway, or that roommate. So who cares? Uh, now remember, attachment is the legal word we use to define the moment that a valid security interest is created. It exists. It says nothing about who's first in line. Attachment just means you have a valid, legitimate, legally recognized security interest. And so that's that means it attached. Lots of people could have an attached security interest in the same stuff. And so that's why we have to go to the second level, which is who's first in line. Now, that's going to become very important today when we talk about bankruptcy. Because when you're dealing with a bankruptcy, the whole point is there's not enough money to go around. So who's going to get the limited small amount of money that we have left? That's why priority becomes very important. And so our options include, number one, Filing a financing a financing statement. Does anybody remember what we call the form? What's the form called that we file a financing statement? What is it? UCC1. Just a UCC one. Very simple. In fact, in business, there are a lot of people out there that think that when you say the UCC, you're talking about a financing statement that gets filed. It's a routine, regular, everyday part of business in America in all 50 states. So you know better. You know that the UCC governs all kinds of things, including the sale of goods and uh, all these other things that we've studied the UCC for. But for a lot of people, UCC1 is the only thing they know. And so filing a financing statement is way number one. Now remember, to attach, it's three requirements. To perfect, it's three options, meaning... Any one of these is fine. Any one is fine. And the first one is the first one in line, no matter which method he uses to perfect. So number two, by possession of the creditor, that's your pawn shop situation where the guy who makes the loan is the guy who holds the collateral in his possession. And if you don't pay by Friday, he sells it to somebody else. By the way, pretty merciless about that. Go down, beg for more time, no is going to be the answer. And so those guys uh, don't mess around. They have collateral. They have possession. They'll sell it off if they don't get paid. And then the third way was a special way called a PMSI, Purchase Money Security Interest. And that is available to sellers of consumer goods who provide the financing for the buyer to buy it from them. And so it's kind of a one-stop shop kind of a thing. Any three of those ways of perfecting is, is valid, and the first one to exercise whichever one is first in line. Make sense? Good. Now we move on because we want to look at disposition. So we talked about default. Disposition, we talked about that you can use any commercially reasonable procedure. Now, the, the key term here is commercially reasonable manner. And 
that doesn't mean you're going to get full value. See, this oftentimes comes up when somebody owes, say, $5,000, and they're using a boat as collateral, and to them, fair market value of that boat is, say, $10,000. Okay? Is that sufficient collateral for your loan? Sure. So the guy doesn't pay on the $5,000 loan. Now what we're talking about is, do I want a boat or do I want money? I want money, right? And so I go out and sell that $10,000 boat for $4,000. Uh-oh. Was that a commercially reasonable sale? The answer is, we don't look at the price received. We look at the mechanism or the process of the sale. That's what we have to look at. It's the manner in which the sale was advertised, conducted. Now, if I sold, if I told you I sold the boat for $4,000 and you knew its fair market value was 10, you'd immediately be suspicious, right? You'd say, well, what did you do wrong? <laughs> and I would say, well, I needed the cash and so I sold it to my cousin Fred. Hmm. Is me selling it to my cousin Fred going to be a commercially reasonable manner? Probably not. It has to be advertised publicly in most cases. It needs to be uh, given notice, those kinds of things. Now you say, let's say I sell it to my cousin Fred for 10000 full fair market value. Any problem with that? Not really. So a private sale is okay if it results in a fair price. So we don't look at the price as the sole feature, the sole element of determination, but if, as long as we got a fair price, we'll forgive some flaws in the process. If we didn't get a fair price, now we're going to look at the process itself and we can complain about that. Now, why would the debtor complain about the sale of his collateral? Why might he complain about that? Well, because if you only get 4000 then that means he still owes you $1,000. This is a key. Sometimes people get this confused in their mind. They think, well, as long as he recovers the collateral, then I don't owe him anything. It wipes out my debt. Not true. If they don't get total recovery of the full amount that you owe, they can continue to come after you personally even after they sold your stuff and took your collateral. So the fact that they repossess the refrigerator from Best Buy, if I stop making the payments, right? They come and repossess the refrigerator. I say, well, that's the end of that. Not necessarily, because if they sell it and they don't get the full value, which, by the way, used goods never get the full value, then they could still come after me for the difference that I still owe. So that's one reason he might complain. The other thing is, what if, by some magic, they were to recover more than I actually owe? Let's say on my boat I only owe 5000 left and they do sell it for 10000 Who gets the extra 5000 Does the creditor get to keep that as kind of like, you know, a bonus? <laughs> no. If there truly is extra, which doesn't happen very often, but if there truly is an excess, it goes back to the owner, the debtor. Okay. Because after all, he's the one who made those payments. He has that equity in that item. The equity goes back to him. Okay? So that's why he cares about the fairness of the sale. You've often probably heard the term of a fire sale. A fire sale. What are they referring to? Well, usually it's a like going out of business. We need to sell this quick. And so I'll just take whatever you give me kind of a thing. Fire sale is oftentimes used in a disposition of collateral. When you hear something like there was a car auction uh, and they go and buy used cars at this you know, regular weekly auction, what are those cars? Well, some of them are trade-ins, but a lot of them are repossessed cars that they are willing to sell because they already have taken the write-off or they don't have much equity in them anyway, and so you're looking to get a good price out of that. The fact you get a public sale 
does not automatically guarantee you're going to get full price on that. And that's actually viewed to be okay. All right. We talked a little bit about disposition of proceeds, but let me give it to you in kind of an order of payout, right? So let's say we we are the creditor and we're owed $5,000 is the debt. And we sell the collateral for 10,000. Okay? Do we return $5,000 to the debtor. No, not necessarily. Why? Because there are two other things that might come into play that we're also going to subtract from the proceeds. Number one is expenses. Actually goes on top of even the debt. Guess who's in here? Lawyers. Why? Because guess who made the rules of order of distribution? Lawyers. <laughs> so we automatically put ourselves, of course, at the top of the list. By the way, what lawyer would ever represent anybody in bankruptcy or in a distribution like this if he wasn't, if he was last in line? There wouldn't be any incentive. So people would be out there, these poor people would be out there without legal representation. Wow. All right. So let's say that's a thousand dollars. After the debt, there's another thing that could be in line, and that's what we call junior liens. What's that all about? Remember I said you could have more than one person with an attached security interest, but only one can be first in line? Well, that doesn't kick them all out of line. They're still in line. We just now call them junior creditors or junior liens. It means I'm not the first one in line, but I'm still in line. So once the thing is sold, if there's a junior creditor out there, or a bunch of them, we go ahead and pay them off, even though we did all the work of collecting the collateral, selling it off. If there's money left over, we pay off any junior liens. Where would we find out about junior liens? UCC1, remember? It's a public filing. We just look up our debtor, look up our collateral, Find a list of everybody that owes that that uh, he's uh, owed money to, and that's who we contact. We send them a check, and then we find out, uh oh, nothing left to give to the to the debtor. So that's the order: expenses, the balance of the debt, any junior liens, and we subtract all of that from the sale. That's why I say, what's the likelihood there's actually going to be anything left over? Most of the time, there's actually still money owed <laughs> when it comes down to it. In fact, you can end up owing more money in expenses than you ever owed in the first place on the loan. Because they'll charge you for Bubba's repossession. They'll charge you for the lawyer fees of going through legal work. They'll charge you for the process of the sale, so the auctioneer's fee. They'll charge you for any of the contingency fees of the sale. And by the time it's all said and done, there's nothing left for you. And you still owe money. So that's how those kinds of things work. Now, any questions about that, about the sale process or the collateral? Okay. Laws assisting creditors. Now, let's look at some laws assisting debtors. Most states have something called a homestead exemption. I used to be able to show a video clip from a really old black and white movie about the Depression era, and they lost the video streaming rights. The, the publishers lost the rights, so I can't show it anymore. But it's from an old like uh, black and white movie where they were showing how things were in the Depression before we had a homestead exemption. Basically, the bank would come in, and strip your house right out from underneath you for loans that did not relate to your house. It wasn't your mortgage that you missed the payment on. It was something else. They'd come in and take your house away. A homestead exemption says that the family's primary residence cannot be taken by unsecured creditors, meaning people who gave loans that weren't based on that home, or by the bankruptcy trustee. 
that you get to keep your house, your primary residence. Now, some states say up to a certain value so that, you know, a guy doesn't go out and buy a big mansion and say, this is my house, uh, you know, for he and his wife and, and that kind of thing. Some states limit the value. But the whole point is, it doesn't really do society any good if people are made to be homeless or people are thrown in jail over debt. So we don't do those things anymore. We don't throw people out. Now, notice it says here, unsecured creditors. Meaning that if you used your house as collateral for a loan, like a mortgage, and you don't make that payment, they will throw you out. <laughs> that you're, you're going to get evicted. But what this is, this is a protection that says the credit card companies cannot come in and throw you out of your house. Most states have that protection. Other exemptions that exist, and we'll look more at these in bankruptcy, but they will say a certain amount of household furnishings, so they're not going to strip out all the furniture, a certain amount of clothing and personal possessions. We don't want people walking around you know, without any clothes because they all got repossessed. Uh, personal possessions includes even a little bit of jewelry, like your wedding band and your engagement ring, but not the rest of your jewelry necessarily. One vehicle, you get to keep a vehicle. And this one's interesting, tools of the trade. You're a carpenter or you are a mechanic. They can't take your tools. Why? So now you can't work? How's that beneficial for the economy? How is that good for society? How does that get us any closer to you paying your bills if we had to take your tools away? And so tools are protected. Again, all of these are protected from unsecured creditors. If you used your tools as collateral, if you sent gave them to what you know what one of the best things to buy at a pawn shop? Like contractor grade tools. You can get some really good tools at a pawn shop because people have hawked them and traded them in when, when times got tough. And so in that case, there's no protection. But if you're an unsecured creditor, then uh, you can't go after these certain things that are exempt. By the way, all these are talking about state law. We get into bankruptcy, it's governed by federal law. So let's look at bankruptcy here for a little bit. Our last part of the chapter will focus exclusively on bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is a federal, primarily, a federal pathway or right. My computer decided to come on and continues to ding in here. I don't know why that is. It's established by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, specifically talks about it, uh, bankruptcy and the federal jurisdiction for that. The Bankruptcy Reform Act of 78 was amended by another Reform Act in 94, which was amended by another Reform Act in 2005 which the 2005 revisions were fairly major to protect debtors. They made a whole lot of new protections for debtors. There is a specific branch of the federal court system devoted specifically to bankruptcy in each of the circuits, in each of the districts. And so there are judges, federally appointed judges, that do nothing but bankruptcy all day. Every day. Yay. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, I had a guy, when I was in Florida, uh, one of the lawyers we went up against in a case came and asked to talk to me after the case. I thought this is interesting. He drove uh, one of those really weird foreign cars that only really rich people drive. Maybach. You ever heard of that? He called it a Maybach, and he owns one, so I'm going with him. Uh and those, it had weird doors that opened the wrong way. <laughs> it was a really cool car, but it was a luxury car. And uh, I said, what do, you, what do you do? And he says, well, primarily, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer. Bankruptcy business is good. So he came and met with me after this case, and he made a big pitch about how I should join him and we should be the world's greatest bankruptcy lawyers. And he says, Matt, you don't, you don't understand. It'd be It's easy. Once you get all the forms, you basically just have all your paralegals do all the work and you just sign some papers and meet with a client every once in a while. This thing goes like clockwork. I said, aren't you in court all the time? Oh, no, I never go to court. You're, you don't? No, not at all. 
says, uh, matter of fact, I play golf most every day. I mean, he was describing a very interesting lifestyle, and I, I was tempted for a microsecond, you know, <laughs> to go down that road. But uh, what he's describing is a, a system that is pretty much a paper-driven, standardized process. And the judges and the courts work like clockwork. They expect certain forms in a certain order, accompanied by certain facts and information, and it's all very standardized. And that runs under the federal judge uh, that's appointed by uh, the president and confirmed by the Senate. They serve lifetime terms. It's not a bad gig if you can get it, all right? <laughs> but getting it is the hard part, okay? Uh, by the way, the alternative, if you're a federal district judge, not a bankruptcy judge, is to hear drug cases all day. So maybe this is actually the less depressing of the two options for federal judges. <laughs> So what are we dealing with? Well, high-level overview here. The, the two main kinds of bankruptcy are Chapter 7 and Chapter 11. And so oftentimes on the news, mainly in relation to airlines, you will hear about a big company going and declaring bankruptcy. Can anybody think? You guys read the Wall Street Journal every day, right? What's the last company you heard of that went bankrupt? There's no right answer to this. Anybody heard of a company that went? Radio Shack, okay, filed for... Which one? Chapter 7 or Chapter 11? Anybody remember? What is it? Is it 11? Now, that tells us something. Knowing what chapter they filed tells us what kind of bankruptcy it is. If you're truly forever going out of business, throwing in the towel, we're done, it's all over with, like Blockbuster Video or whatever, uh, then actually they might have done an 11 too because I think they went to online streaming. Um, then you are chapter 7, liquidation, literally going out of business, not going to own anything, time to liquidate all the assets. Liquidation means giving it all up, selling it all, liquidation, chapter 7. Chapter 11 is I can't make my payments, I need protection. From whom? Like the Terminator is out to get me or what? No, from the bill collectors, from the creditors. And so chapter 11 says, I don't want to sell everything off. I just need some time to get my business back on track, reorganize some things, and then we can start making our payments again. That's chapter 11. Chapter 12 is for family farmers. We just sort of throw that in because that one does exist and is out there. And then chapter 13 is like an individual's personal payment plan. So chapter 13 is like chapter 11, but for individuals. Chapter 11 is for corporate reorganization. 13 is for individuals, okay? So let's start looking through a couple of these and some of their unique features and how it works. Chapter 7, liquidation. Well, this is the most familiar one. Any person can do chapter 7. So going back to our list, chapter 7, individuals or corporations, either one can do chapter 7. Any person, including a corporation. The cool thing about liquidation is that not only do you liquidate all your stuff, but once your stuff runs out, all your debts are canceled. You get a clean slate. All debts are, and this is the key word in bankruptcy, discharged. Discharged. That's the legally significant word, discharged, in bankruptcy. Discharged means it's over. It's done. You can't try to collect it anymore. doesn't exist. Now, here's some things that discharged does not mean. It does not mean that the creditor got paid. It does not mean that it was fair. It does not mean that the debtor didn't somehow game the system <laughs> or get away with something. It just means it's over. Move on with life. <laughs> You're not getting paid. It's discharged. Over with. As if it never happened. There are probably some spiritual application to some of this, but... We won't go there today. All debts are discharged. Now, it starts 
with a voluntary or involuntary petition. Now, the involuntary ones are a lot of fun. That's where somebody doesn't think that they're insolvent, but yet their creditors do, and so they, they push them into bankruptcy. But it starts with a filing of a petition. The minute you file your petition in bankruptcy, all debt collection activities must immediately stop, be suspended. They cannot email you again, call you again, write one more letter. If they do, they're in big trouble. So you file this petition and send out a notice to all your creditors saying, back off, Jack, I have an automatic stay. No court action required for the automatic stay. Now that's temporary. It's temporary while we get the paperwork going and you get 90 days or so, but you get an automatic stay. Everybody's got to back off. Now, if it's a voluntary petition, it's the debtor himself that's filing it, right? You go and you declare bankruptcy. If it's involuntary, then it's your creditors who are filing this against you and forcing you into bankruptcy. And so that makes for fun conversations, you know, if someone is being forced into bankruptcy. Ultimately, what you are seeking is from the court an order for relief. That's what the ultimate verdict is called, an order for relief. Now, under the 2005 code, it became a more touchy-feely kind of a emotional process. And we inserted in there a bunch of stuff that the lawyers have to do. For example, we now have to do debt counseling. So when the creditor, when the debtor comes in, we have to sit down with him and put a box of tissues on the conference room table and say, now, you do understand that you have other options here other than declaring bankruptcy. Yes. Uh, and then the client will ask you something like, do any of those other options cancel out my debts? Well, no. No, they don't. But some of them, you know, would involve you having more time to repay and talking through some of the other chapters and some of those kinds of things. So we give them the other alternatives. And we have this nice little meeting between the client and the lawyer. If we forget to do that, the lawyer now gets sanctioned. One of my goals as a lawyer is never to join my client in jail <laughs> or to be sanctioned. It's like the old joke where the guy goes through the trial, a criminal trial, uh, defending a guy and he, his client's found guilty and gavel is, is, uh, smacked down, guilty is charged and, and, uh, the client turns to the lawyer and says, well, where do we go now? And the lawyer says, well, uh, you go to jail and I'm going home. <laughs> what do you mean we? <laughs> we're, we're done with this journey together. All right. You, you now pay the price. And so one of me, one of your goals as a lawyer is never to go with your client to jail. And the other one is never to get sanctioned for forgetting to do something. And this is one of those times. And so what this nice little touchy feely meeting actually now amounts to is that the lawyer has a standardized boilerplate form that has all these things on it in legalese, and he has a signature form at the bottom that says, here, client, read your rights, sign this at the bottom that I showed you this, and I'm putting it in the file. That's all it is. So later on, we're going to see the lawyer has to file an affidavit that shows under oath that he told the client what his other options are, and this is what that's referring to. The debtor does not have to be insolvent. Now, in law school, you spend about two weeks of your time just figuring out what the word insolvent really means. But the simple undergraduate definition of insolvent, which everyone else in the world understands makes perfect sense, is that you can't pay your bills. You have income of X and bills of X plus something. <laughs> Okay, and every month you're underwater. You don't have sufficient income to keep the the creditors at bay. It has nothing to do necessarily with assets. It's talking more about your your cash flow. All right, so that's insolvent. And used to be before all those reforms that one of the things the debtor had to prove is that he was in fact insolvent. He was unable to make his payments on a monthly basis. But under the revisions, we no longer have to prove that necessarily, that we are insolvent. 
In fact, it is presumed if you are filing bankruptcy that you are, in fact, insolvent and that you don't have enough to pay your bills. Now, when we talk about substantial abuse, what we're talking about here is somebody who actually could pay their bills but is choosing to use the bankruptcy system to get out of debt that they really should be paying. And this can be acute. So like Donald Trump goes through bankruptcy and everybody goes, now wait a minute, this is one of the richest people in the world. How can this guy be bankrupt? Now, by the way, if the Donald is listening, I I understand he has not personally declared bankruptcy. It's his businesses that have declared bankruptcy almost routinely, but not him personally because he sued people multiple times over claiming that he personally had been bankrupt. I understand that's not the case. But the question becomes, if we're suspicious that a really rich person who could pay their bills is using bankruptcy almost in a fraudulent way to get out of debt, what can we do? Well, we can look at the income of the debtor, and we can even look at his entire family income, and if the debtor's family income is greater than the state median, which I know the statistics people will tell you that's not the average, but for lawyers it's the average, <laughs> okay? The average state income, if it's greater than that, then we're actually going to presume that this is an abuse, and we're going to make him prove with spreadsheets and with evidence that he actually can't pay his debts. So if he makes more than the average income, he has an extra step he has to go through to prove that he is not abusing the process, and we call that means testing. Means testing. So I know it's confusing to talk about means testing involving the median income, but there are two different processes that they're referring to there. All right, so stats people probably hate that, but... That's what it means. All right, so in 2005, what changes basically came along? Well, we said that debtors had to go through 180 days uh, prior to filing. They had to go through approved debt counseling with some sort of a nonprofit agency. So prior to filing, before you can file for bankruptcy now, you have to go to counseling with a FINRA-approved Credit counseling company. By the way, these nonprofit debt reorganization groups out there, pretty shady. A lot of really shady ones out there that are making an awful lot of money personally for being nonprofit, but that's now legally in the law that you have to get counseling. You, the lawyer has to put in an affidavit explaining that he told you the other options. That's what I referred to before. And now this is the biggie. The lawyer must verify the accuracy of the petition personally subject to perjury penalties. Yeah, the lawyer is now on the hook for his client telling the truth. That's probably when my friend Don, who was trying to get me to become a bankruptcy attorney, decided it was time to retire. <laughs> you know? Because... That's That all of a sudden makes all the rest of the lawyers go, well, wait a minute. You mean if my client is lying and hiding money, I'm on the hook for perjury? Whoa, what's that going to do to the lawyers other than trying to get out of the business? It's going to make them a lot more interested in verifying the accuracy of those petitions personally. And that was the goal of those reforms. So in Chapter 7, what do we do? Well... On your petition, you're going to list out all of the creditors. There are boxes and forms to fill out. First, you list the secured creditors and say what their collateral was. Then you list the unsecured creditors and what their amounts were basically owed. You must include their addresses, and you must accurately list them. This is one of the most important parts of the application because everybody listed here is going to get their debt discharged on them. <laughs> Your debt will be discharged if it's listed. If you forget to list somebody, or you put the wrong address on there, or you misspell the name, you run the risk that they won't get discharged. That's the consequence. So get this part right 
and we have a lot more confidence in the end result. So we list it all out. Then there's a second part two that says, okay, those are the debts. Now, tell us all about your stuff. Tell us your, your, how much money you have in the bank. Tell us about your assets. List them all out specifically. And it has different categories and you kind of have to be an accountant to go through and inventory all of your property. And then there's a part three that says, okay, that was your assets. Now part three, tell us about your income and tell us about your expenses. And this is where you say, well, every week I get paid this amount and every week I have to pay out this amount, okay? It's all done under oath. You have to swear to it under oath, sign it under federal uh, perjury charges. By the way, the federal government takes perjury very seriously. Uh, and it is a federal crime to misrepresent anything on the petition. That gets the ball rolling. By the way, that's what he was talking about when he said the paralegals do all the paperwork. That's all they do. They're going through people's stuff and trying to get it all listed and out and do that very accurately. Now, we pause for a minute. That's a voluntary petition. In an involuntary position, the creditors force you into bankruptcy and this is kind of presumed if, number one, you have 12 or more creditors, three or more of which have claims totaling, and this is a weird amount, $13,475, or you have 12 or more creditors and one has a claim of at least $13,475. Now, because these amounts are so small, they haven't really kept up with the times, that's a lot of people. A lot of people would be in that boat. And if the debtor has those that level of debt, and only that level of debt required, the creditors could force him into bankruptcy. Why would they not force him into bankruptcy? Because he's making his payments and he's keeping everybody happy. But if he stops, if all of a sudden one or more of them get uh, concerned about that, they could force him into involuntary Chapter 7. So what happens? Well, as soon as we file the petition, we get the automatic stay. The creditors cannot commence or continue legal action. Let's say that you have a lawsuit against your company for patent infringement in the Eastern District of Michigan going on, and your company declares bankruptcy in Minnesota six months after that litigation started. Guess what happens to that patent litigation? On hold immediately, because this is a federal thing. And so even though your bankruptcy came later, why? What's that got to do with the patent case? Because a patent is an asset of that company. And this case might call it into question or its value into question. And so the bankruptcy freezes any pending actions that you have in court. It also prevents any creditors from commencing any action or any collection efforts, any further collection efforts. If they violate the stay, they can lose their place in line or, or be otherwise sanctioned by the court. Now, once that part of the process is done, we have this stay, what else is there left to do then in the bankruptcy? Well, a trustee is appointed. The creditors actually elect the trustee. Notice it's not the debtor that gets to appoint it, and it's really not the court that selects him. It's the creditors that get together for a meeting. That means all the people you owe money to get together for a meeting. I'm kind of warm in here. Elect the trustee that they want to be the one to administer the estate. Now, what's that process? It's the process of pulling together all of the stuff, cataloging it, inventorying it, and valuing it, and then pulling together all the debts, classifying them, prioritizing them, and valuing them, matching up any secured creditors, get the item that they had out of the estate, does not include any items of collateral that have a secured interest. We pay them off first, right? And then we match up the rest of it. So what is included 
in the debtor's estate. The estate describes the bucket of all of his assets. That's the estate. And so what's included? Well, all of his legal and equitable interests in property, property transferred in avoidable transaction. You spend about a week on this in law school, avoidable transactions. What it basically means is anything that you gave out of the ordinary within the six months before you filed the petition, because you kind of knew in the back of your mind you were going to file bankruptcy, so you went and you paid off the loan to your dad ahead of time, and then you filed bankruptcy. Guess what? The trustee can go get that money from your dad and say, nope, that was a preferential transfer, a fraudulent transfer, because it was within the six-month window before the petition was filed. So he gets to go back and get any voidable transactions. He also gets to throw in there anything you acquire within 180 days after filing. So the guy that wins the lottery five months after he, after he filed bankruptcy, guess what happens to that lottery winnings? They go into the estate. And he's probably going to get booted out of bankruptcy too. The proceeds and profits from any property of the estate, that means he can sell off those assets and put the money back in the bucket of the estate. And any after-acquired property, such as inheritances, big winnings of lottery or uh, of business transactions, life insurance pro- proceeds, sale of property, anything like that, any after-acquired property goes in the bucket. So he gets that bucket together in that estate, and that becomes the pot from which he pays off all of the creditors. Now, next thing he has to do is say, what is exempt? What can I sell off and what do I not sell off? Well, he lets you keep some equity in your personal home, assuming that your mortgage company hasn't already evicted you, up to $3,200 and something dollars in a car, and you see the rest of the list certain personal possessions, a little bit of jewelry, some tools, social security, alimony, support payments, child support payments. Why? Those really aren't yours. All right, those are for the benefit of the children. Up to $20,000 in personal injury awards that you might have had or been entitled to. Uh, The new homestead exemption went from $20,000 to 136,875,000. So the federal government changed that in 2005 to increase the equity in your home. The idea is we don't want you losing your personal home. But other than that, everything else is pretty much fair game. Notice that's not a very nice car, $3,225. I doubt you could find a used car in Watertown right now for $3,225. Thanks to uh, Cash for Clunkers. So then, after the trustee administers the estate, collects all the proceeds, he liquidates the assets. That's why we call it liquidation. Bye-bye to all your stuff. And he pays the creditors in order of priority. Let's look at that priority. This is the priority over here. So this is a nice little diagram because it's got it all like in one place. These are the things that are in the estate. The trustee then pays them out in the order that's presented. Secured creditors, what do they get? They get the asset that was secured. What if it's not enough to satisfy the whole debt? Then they become, for whatever's left, an unsecured creditor. So if I was owed 10000 and the security interest was in a car and I get the car and I sell it for 5000 I'm still owed the 5000 but now I'm back in line with everybody else as an unsecured creditor for the remaining amount. So this is the order that gets paid. Now notice, after uh, child support, which the lawyers debated heavily, but ultimately the kids won. Guess who gets paid? 
we, we call it administrative expenses, but what it essentially means is the court and the lawyers, okay? The lawyers get paid up front. Um, you'll see here in Wisconsin, somebody will advertise $500 flat fee for bankruptcy. You pay that up front. And I always thought it was kind of, kind of ironic because somebody's bankrupt, but they can still come up with the $500 for the bankruptcy up front cash. The lawyers get paid first. Then, if you're a business, your employees come next. Wages and salaries owed to employees. And then benefit plans. So those two kind of go together. Consumer deposits, then taxes and fines. So the government's high up on the list in line. Claims resulting from driving while intoxicated, so DUI claims. And then and only then, after all of these first 11 or so people are paid, then we get to the credit card companies and the general unsecured creditors. They are, as you can see, if this is a bus, they are at the back of the bus, getting off last. Whatever's left after he's paying all this out, now that is left to go to the general creditors. Notice why it's so important, the first thing we talked about in the chapter. Look at the difference in where you are in line if you have a security interest versus if you have an unsecured debt. Where would you rather be as a business? Now, if by some miracle everybody here gets paid and there are a few dollars left over, we hand them to you as the debtor and say, have a good start to your new life, <laughs> okay? The good news is you don't have any debt. We discharge it all. The bad news is here's $7. <laughs> you know, that's all you have to get started with. That's the order of preference, okay? Now, there are some exceptions to discharge, things that cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. And the one I want to point out to you the most is at the bottom of the list here, Sorry, you know, wouldn't that be great? Because I promise you, probably all of you qualify for bankruptcy right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay. I mean, I got no job. I, you know, I'm a student worker in the DC or whatever, like I was when I was in high, in college. Uh, I, I certainly have no assets. My business law textbook is all I have, you know, left over. It's got some very interesting highlights and drawings in it, but other than that, not very valuable. Uh, so hey, here's my here's my idea. I got 80 grand or whatever in student loans. I put the whole thing right on the student loan, and then I graduate, declare bankruptcy, wipe it all out. Now I have my diploma. What are they gonna do? Take your diploma? No, they can't do that. So I'm free, right? Great plan. Except that written right into the law of bankruptcy, cannot discharge student loans in bankruptcy. Now there are ways. <laughs> <laughs> like, number one, pay it off on a credit card. Pay it off on a credit card. Make the minimum payments for six months just to get outside the window and then go into bankruptcy and it's the credit card, not a student loan. You didn't hear it from me, all right? But that is a possibility. Uh, let me know if it works, by the way. I've never actually tested that out, all right? But seems in theory like, hey, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, except for that, it might be hard to get a credit card that had a limit of like $80,000 on it as a recent college graduate. But if you can do it, genius, okay? In fact, they might come and arrest me as a co-conspirator, okay? <laughs> but, but student loans, now, uh, that's a joke, but there is a le legitimate way if you can show that the repayment is creating an undue hardship. So there is an exception to the exception, and that is if the student loans themselves are creating undue hardship. And I did see a case once with a single mom who had a crushing amount of student loan debt. And But these days with income-based repayment options, it's kind of hard to show undue hardship because it's sort of like based on your income, so <laughs> it's meant to be variable. But uh, some of those things are a trap. Income-based repayment can be a trap because if you make the minimum payments on that, you literally will never pay off your student loan. The, the interest keeps accruing on top. All right? So those are some exceptions and things that cannot be discharged. What if you're a crazy person, and after having your debt discharged, you want to go back and reaffirm the debt and pay it anyway? I've had this happen once with a Christian school. Guy owed a Christian school money, goes through bankruptcy, and says... 
they discharged all the back tuition, and then he goes back to the Christian school and wants to re-enroll his kid for <laughs> the next year. And they said, "Are you nuts? No, I mean we're not <laughs> putting your kid in. You still owe it. You 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 know stuck us with ten thousand dollars in back tuition." He says, "All right, all right, all right. I'll pay you. I'll pay you what I got discharged. I don't have to pay you, but I will." Kind of interesting. You can reaffirm a debt. Has to be in writing. Has to be filed with the court. Okay. And the debtor can rescind it at any time. So it's really not all that strong of a reaffirmation. Uh, I wouldn't really bank on that if I was a creditor. Okay. All right. Let's, let's switch gears to talk about 11 real quick and we'll be done for today. Chapter 11, reorganization is where, the for corp, corporations mainly, the debtor and creditor formulate a plan under which the debtor pays off a portion of their debts and discharges the rest. The idea is here, I need some space. I can't pay it on the schedule that we originally agreed, but I think if you give me time, I can get my act back together and we can make this work. You can do it through a workout, which is, as it turns out, nothing to do with physical fitness uh, and everything to do with the agreement that the creditor and debtor enter into. And you file that workout agreement with the court, and then you have court protection from all the creditors for that agreement. The reorganization plan has to be accepted by the creditors and ultimately by the court. If the, if the, if there is a creditor holding out, by the way, the court can jam it down their throat and uh, require them to accept it by court order. But it gives the debtor space. It gives him the chance. Now, these days, courts prefer Chapter 11 because that way, eventually, people are getting paid. And so if, for some reason, you get booted out of Chapter 7, they will boot you into Chapter 11. And they will say, wait a minute, you really shouldn't be in a liquidation. We're going to kick you over into a chapter 11. And that's, uh, that's the corporate reorganization plan. Chapter 13 is for individuals, same basic thing. And this is where there's certain monetary qualifications. Uh, and notice chapter 13, not available for partnerships or corporations. Uh, you get three years to get your pay, debts paid. You're not long-term planning here. This is a three-year window. Get your act together. Oh, by the way, our corporate reorganization, one of the things that they're going to insist on, this is bad news if you're the president of a corporation going into Chapter 11, you're getting fired. The executives are out. Basically, the debtors are at the mercy now of the creditors. And the creditors will appoint new management for the company. So when Delta Airlines goes under reorganization, the president's out and the, the creditors take over the business. And they say, okay, what you're telling us is that the reason you're in this mess is that you guys ran it into the ground and yet you're coming to us saying you're the geniuses that are going to bring it all out of this hole that you dug for yourself? I don't think so. It's the old adage, your best thinking got you into this hole is probably not going to get you out. <laughs> you need someone else's thinking to get you out of it. And so you're out of there. They're going to bring in their own uh, their own guys. All right? That's what we deal with in Chapter 11. Chapter 13 is the default for uh, individuals, is the repayment plan. You kind of have to prove that you really deserve Chapter 7 these days. And so courts are going to kind of force you more into the repayment uh, mode than they are into uh, liquidation. All right? By the way, once you complete your payment plan, the incentive is everything else discharged. Everything else discharged. So if it wasn't included in the repayment plan as being something you had to pay back, once you finish that obligation, no other fees, no other costs, no other expenses, you're out, you're done. This is actually a great option for individuals. I'll mention one other thing and we'll be done. This is the federal system. Most states have an alternate bankruptcy option. Wisconsin has a very nice bankruptcy plan and procedure. 
It's cheaper than the federal, it's faster than the federal, and it's more friendly to the debtor. But it only discharges Wisconsin debts. <laughs> the state of Wisconsin cannot discharge out-of-state debts, so it's very limited in its utility because of that. All right. So some states have bankruptcy mechanisms as well and have certain advantages, but uh, it's the federal that we kind of look at most widely used. All right. Okay, that's bankruptcy and secured transactions. Okay, have a great day. Stay warm. Good day. Stay warm.